month. I was impressed with how many people gave so generously. Well done. And then I was just telling Tracy before the service began that this is honestly the best singing congregation I've ever been part of, which means somewhere along the line there was excellent music education in your lives because everyone learned how to sing. Whether it's a song you know or not, you plow right into it, and that's amazing. I've been in congregations of 300 that don't sing as well as you. So well done. It's just, every once in a while you need to sit in the front so you can hear it. It's this overwhelming arc of sound that just comes up and floods over. So happy to be part of this group. So well done with that. And then finally, I've never given that list of names to any other congregation because I knew they wouldn't tackle it. <laughs> so another, well done. Well, I started searching my gene genealogy a long time ago, but I quit right after my mother told me that one of my great-grandfathers was a philanderer and another was arrested as a horse thief. <laughs> Those are true facts. I decided the rest was best left unknown. Now, genealogy is not a new subject of interest. In fact, as you just heard, the Bible is filled with chapters that talk about who was the father of whom. And the passage we just heard wonderfully read from Matthew's Gospel is Matthew's version of the genealogy of Jesus. Matthew starts with a well-known figure in our Judeo-Christian history, Abraham, the father of the Jewish faith. And then Matthew then lists Jesus' ancestors until he comes to King David and King Solomon, and from there Matthew keeps plowing forward until he gets to Jesus. Now, some of us have well-known ancestors in our genealogy. By and large, however, most of our genealogies contain names that only we and a few of our family members actually recognize. The same holds true for most of the names in Matthew's genealogy of Jesus. Some of us will recognize a few of the names out of Matthew's 42, which means a lot of the people related to Jesus lived lives that were just not that noteworthy. People in first century Israel may have known many of the names on the list, but let's face it, only a few of them passed the test of time. And I suspect that is true of most of our lists on our genealogy. The people who lived right after someone might recognize the name and remember the person, but let's face it, most of the names and lives of the people in our genealogies just did not pass the test of time. And I know it's true for me, I suspect it's true for most of us. A few people we've known in our lives well, they might be famous, they might be really well known. A few people we know might even be remembered and have their names remembered for centuries, but the vast majority of us will soon be forgotten once we and those who lives, whose lives we touched leave this world. Yet the names listed in Matthew's Gospel, while not recognizable to the masses, gave birth to Jesus our Christ. Each one of them lived as faithfully as they knew how. They passed along their faith as well as they knew how to do. And their faith not only survived through, but through the family span of generations, their faith evidently grew and prospered. And Jesus, their successor, came into the world and revolutionized the way we understand and connect with God. Jesus, their child, their grandchild, their great-grandchild, their great to the 28th number grandchild came into this world and introduced people to God in a way they had never experienced before or since. We may not recognize their names or know much about their lives and their accomplishments, but they shared their faith in a way that endured the test of time, and the result was the name of a man that people called the Messiah, the anointed one of God. The result was a man who was both divine and human. They could have done worse. Now, if we were able to examine each of our genealogies carefully, I know we would come across a name of an ancestor 
who became the first Christian in our long line of ancestors. Some of us might only have to go back one or two generations. I suspect others of us would have to go back all the way to the first century to find the first Christian in our family lineage. If we were able to look closely and carefully enough, I'm confident we would each find the name of that person who introduced our family to Christianity. And I suspect most of us do not know the name of the first Christian in our family trees. But they were there sometime in the past. And after that one ancestor, generations of our ancestors shared their faith with those who came after them. Now, sometimes actively practicing the faith skipped a generation or two, but the root of the faith never disappeared completely. And today, here we are, part of a long line of people who hold on to our faith today. Now, I will readily admit that I am confident 2,000 years from now, no one in my family or in the world will know or remember my name and how I lived. But I do know that our faith will still be part of our family tree. I do know our faith will be strong and it will survive the test of time. And I suspect we will all have similar experiences as the generations roll by. We may not be remembered by our name or for how we lived, but our faith will live on in our family trees. Our faith will survive the test of time. So as we prepare for the coming of Christ into our world, I invite each of us to take a few moments to think back to the family members in our lives who shared Jesus with us. We may not know all of the names, but we are here today because someone, somewhere in our family, or someone somewhere in our chosen family, passed their faith along to us. So I invite each of us to spend some time this week thinking about that unknown and probably unrecognizable person for living their faith as well as they could. And we can take time to thank that person for making sure that their faith began and was passed along in our family tree. And then I invite each of us to spend some time thinking about how we can share our faith today with our family and with our chosen family. And if we're comfortable with words, we can use words. But I suspect that, well, our actions will speak far more loudly than our words. We can share our faith with others by inviting someone who would otherwise be alone to join us for a meal. And it doesn't have to be a big meal like Thanksgiving or Christmas. Some weeknight, somebody we know who would otherwise be alone, invite them to join us for a meal. Or maybe we can forgive that family member we haven't talked to for years. Or we can invite a guest to sit with us during worship. We can, invite one of, we can visit one of our church members who doesn't get out very much in their homes or in their care facilities. In this post-election season where the rancor is still quite bitter in some places, we can actively, we can decide to actively love our enemies or those we perceive to be enemies. We can engage in conversation with those who have an entirely different point of view and come together with a desire for peace and understanding. And of course, we can treat others the way we want to be treated. Now, my grandfather, Albert Lohr, didn't spend many Sundays in church. I never knew the man, but I'm told that rather than go to church during the Depression and the Farm Depression, he would go out to the store on Saturdays and buy a big block of cheese. Remember blocks of cheese? That's how it used to come, and rather than in individually slice, individual slices wrapped in saran wrap and yeah, whatever. He would go with a big block of cheese or really a really long sausage or a collection of smaller sausages and he would go to visit the homes of widows to share that cheese or sausage with them. These were the days before social security and widows were notoriously poverty stricken. And he would spend time in conversation and he would then cut off a bunch of the, uh, a block out of the smaller block and give it to the widow or a piece of the sausage and give it to her. I never met the man 
But that is an action that shared his faith with his children. And while words may be important to us, it is our actions that will speak more loudly to our children and to those around us than our words. So friends, our names and our deeds in this world may not stand the test of time, but if we all live our faith the way someone lived it for us, we can be confident that Jesus' name will always be remembered, recognized, and worshipped. That is one of my hopes on this first Sunday of Advent. Amen. Amen. Amen.